Okay, everybody, CQ, as it were, for the next session. Uh, very pleased to present Noel Matthews talking about receiving ham TV from the ISS, uh, something we all, all like to achieve. So, hand you over to Noel. Thank you, Barry, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, morning. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, uh, we, we heard from... Uh, a little more about ARIS yesterday and the potential of uh, doing the school's contacts and of course we're, we're off there next week, this week, sorry, to Broadstairs to do a, another school's contact. Um, and I think it's a, a timely reminder that actually uh, we were very fortunate during the Tim Peake Principium mission to be able to receive live video from the ISS. Um, when Tim was up there and the difference it made to the contacts was just just phenomenal and it's uh, it's been a while since we saw I, uh, Ham TV um, because there was a failure which I'll uh, talk about but there are renewed efforts to try and get it back on board so that hopefully sometime next year it could be available again for uh, contacts. So we thought it would be useful just to have a reminder, talk a little bit about the history, show a, show a video of what we did, and uh, talk about how you can receive ham TV or what is required to receive ham TV from the ISS. Good, okay. So the original ham TV unit which is this box here, the blue box here, was installed actually 10 years ago um, in 2013 and was actually commissioned in 2014. G G4KLB was the first station to receive the uh, ham TV unit. He actually happened to be, or not happened to be, but he was equipped to receive ham TV and was around when the commissioning tests were done by uh, the astronaut on board and actually he's got uh, on his YouTube channel, he's got the video of the commissioning tests and that was, uh, that was April 2014. We then went on and used it in 2016 and it did get uh, some use after that, but we used it. We were the primary users really in 2016 for Tim Peake. Uh, but in 2019, the unit, was, uh, the unit failed and was his, he eventually shipped back to Kaiser Italia, who were the integrators of the unit, and it was shipped back there for repair. And that one. Good. So... The current status is a bit vague, but it, it has been repaired and it is now back with ARIS US. However, NASA have um, asked for some more tests to be done, particularly on the RF performance. When it was uh, commissioned 10 years ago, um, things weren't as stringent as they are now. and the testing really that they've done just recently has showed that it doesn't meet the NASA standards anymore. Um, and so there is a need for more TX filtering. And the ARIS U uh, US team reached out to uh, a few of us in the UK and um, Dave Crump, Phil Crump, Graham and myself have had a few calls with uh, ARIS in the US. Uh, Graham bought uh, a filter which we then supplied to them, a three-pole filter um, which we supplied to them. Um, they've looked at that and it's probably not going to be give enough protection further out, far out. So they're probably going to have to go with a five-pole filter on the output of the transmitter. And those of you who know anything about it, will know that that will increase the insertion loss. The filter itself is likely to have in excess of a dB loss, but of course it means we've got to have more interconnecting cables to get to it. So we're probably looking that the power output, when it eventually does get on board, could be reduced by anything around 3 dB, which is 
significant or could be significant, particularly when you're trying to receive it at horizon. It will be fine overhead, but uh, trying to receive it at the margins, that could well going to be uh, make a difference. The latest launch guesstimate. <laughs> Is that vague enough? Do you get, get the impression? Um, could be spring next year. It was, when we, when we started down this road, it was going to be spring this year. Um, and then it went to autumn. And now it looks potentially, as lo if we can fix the, uh, the problems and get NASA approval again for it, it looks as if it will be uh, in spring, hopefully, early uh, 2024. Uh, then, once it's on the ISS, that's not the end of the story. It has to be reinstalled and recommissioned by a trained astronaut. Uh, one of the reasons why we were quite hopeful that it was going to go up this year was there was actually uh, an astronaut who was a, uh, a radio amateur. Not an astronaut who'd been trained to become a radio amateur, but a, an amateur who had become an astronaut. So, um, was more technically astute and able to install it. But hopefully, um, you know, summer 24, it will be up there. And uh, But as uh, one amongst us, oh, Graham, is known to say that space schedules only ever move to the right. So we'll see. Um, the actual repairs, uh, the original unit has been repaired. We don't. 100% know what the problem was. We believe it was in the area of the modulator. But they did manage to make a software change so that the DVB service information is now um, correct. Um, those of you who may remember that to receive Ham TV um, when it was up originally, you had to run a special version of Jean Pierre's Mini Tuner software because the service information contained in the data stream wasn't complete and so a standard set-top box wouldn't receive it, it wouldn't decode it. We now understand that that has been uh, changed so that any receiver should in theory be able to receive it. It will unfortunately still be DVB-S, not S2, and MPEG-2. So it's the original unit specification and it will probably be more almost certainly be running on 23595 megahertz. Um, there's some doubt, certainly I'm not sure exactly what the situation is. Um, those of you who remember and tried to receive it will remember that when the, a lot of the time the transmitter was left running, but the camera wasn't plugged in. And so we all got very excited about seeing a blue line, which was some noise in the video circuit, a blue line down the, cent uh, down the side of a black screen. And uh, we got very excited by that. Plus, Graham got very excited by uh, the system noise on the audio. He could actually hear the clocks in the ISS if he turned the audio up loud enough. But um, we understand that an HDMI pattern generator has now been built, uh, but we're not sure if it's got approval to be included on, uh, on going back up to the space station. Uh, and so we believe that we will probably be back to the black screen and the blue line. Um, you notice there that I said HDMI, uh, all the cameras on the space station have now been upgraded to HDMI, and so there has to be a, an H HDMI to composite uh, converter because the, direct, the uh, ham TV unit is still very much a composite input unit. So that's where we are. We believe once it does go up, it will, uh, it will be pretty much the same as it was before, apart from the DVB-S uh, service information will be correct. So um, let's talk a little bit about how you can receive it and the challenges of receiving it. Uh, Ham, Ham TV runs, a question mark, based on what I've just said, uh, 5 watts to a, a relatively simple patch antenna on the side of the ISS. Um, uh, but the pr one of the problems is that that patch is surrounded by a large amount of clutter and even down to uh, the RF performance can be variable. Um, 
as the ISS sli does fly slightly, fl flies in inverted commas, slightly nose down. Um, and the RF performance we found when it was arising from the west, as it does, um, was, was slightly variable depending upon what clutter was actually uh, docked on the ISS at the time. And so um, it's, it, it can be challenging to receive it, but when it's overhead, it's, it's relatively simple. But to get the margins, which is when you get the extra time, of course, um, is, can be a bit unpredictable. So how to receive it? I had to include it, Graham. He's not looking. <laughs> okay, so it's possible to receive, as Graham proved at Goon Hilly, uh, it's possible to receive ham TV on a simple antenna when the ISS is overhead because it is line of sight. It's 200 miles, 220 miles, but it is line of sight and it is possible to receive it on a... There we go. So there's a whole tale behind that picture, but we won't go there. So it was taken down at Goon Hilly when we were testing the antenna down at Goon Hilly. Um, so uh, typically what Graham would be able to receive on an antenna like that is the ISS in a window of three or four minutes when it's overhead. But as it goes further away, it gets more difficult. And so if you want to receive the ISS for anything up to 10 minutes, 11 minutes, you certainly need to look at putting in uh, a dish. But of course, then you've then got to think about the, the whole tracking issue that you get with Leo's. Um, transmissions are right-hand circular. So there's, a, there's an interesting potential that you may be able to receive on your Q0100 potty dish. Certainly, um, it'll be very interesting at the time when... Uh, it flies through the uh, the arc of uh, which it must do at some point. Go through uh, Q0100, although of course it's on the wrong band. So you need you you if you wanted to use your potty, you'd have to disconnect your transmitter and put your receiver on the uh, on the flat plate. Something to experiment with. Um, basic RF engineering applies. Um, you will need. An LNA, a uh, low noise amplifier, and it needs to be at masthead. But you will also probably need a manpass filter. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff happening these days uh, up on those types of frequencies. And of course, two three nine five is only five megahertz away from uh, channel one on the uh, two point four gig Wi-Fi band. So you need to um, you need to take care of that. Um, also, if you're very, very unlucky, you may live next door. The band 2390 to 2400 is now licensed by Ofcom for um, occasional links or, or links. If you're unlucky, you may, of course, live next to one of those, in which case your chances of receiving this could be uh, relatively low. Because it's on 2395, the first thing you'll have to worry about is uh, a down converter to get the RF frequency down to match your tuner frequency. If you're running uh, one of the BATC mini tuners with the Serret tuner, that's not an issue because um, the Serret tuner does in fact cover 2395 natively. So having got the dish, and we'll talk more about the tracking in a minute, uh, if you've got the dish, and then you've sorted out a nice low noise amplifier and a, and a, and a bit of filtering. You then need to look at the receiver. Um, as I said earlier, because we understand they've corrected the service information problems, any DVB-S, not S2, receiver should work. Um, however, a lot of the commercial set-top boxes really aren't ideal for this because they, they tend to need you to scan a frequency. But of course, this, this is, you know, the I, you wouldn't be able to scan it before the ISS appeared. So if you tried to scan it while the ISS was visible, it would be yet another variable. So what we would recommend is um, a receiver which is designed for DATV. 
and all of the um, all of the BATC receivers have been tested, and because we did an uh, we managed to capture the I and Q from one of the Tim Pete transmissions, we've actually been able to play that back and confirmed that the ride and ports down will will receive ham tv and that's actually a ham tv signal being received by a ports down receiver that's tim peak of course that was 2016 and the ports down receiver didn't appear till 2019 so uh, you know we we have confirmed that uh, you know a, a standard receiver from batc will work so um this presentation was actually uh, written for a non-AMSAT audience, but of course you all understand this being AMSAT, um, that uh, it's not like QO100. It was actually, uh, I actually wrote this for the uh, ATV conference at uh, Friedrichshafen Ham Radio, where they, they all sort of think in terms of ham uh, QO100. But of course it's not like QO100, it's moving rather fast, and a pass lasts a maximum of 11 minutes, which means there is this added level of complication. And um, you need to track it. Uh, a 1.2 meter dish has got about beam width of about six degrees. So you've got to keep it fairly accurate uh, for the whole pass. And it, it, it's X and Y, obviously. And if particularly if you want to receive it at the margins, which is where the real benefit of using a dish is, your tracking needs to be pretty accurate. So, first thing you need to do is, there's not much option really other than buy a, a Yesu GR 5600 and every couple of years you'll be taking it apart to replace the seals and oil and bearings and as yes, I've been there and done that. Um, but the, the Yesu box does allow you to do computer control tracking. Uh, I personally use PST Rotator. I know there's several other programs around that will do it. Um, and my advice to certainly uh, people is that before the ISS comes along, get the dish up and track the sun. Um, you can use um, PST Rotator will enable you to track the sun. The great thing about a prime focus dish rather than an offset, which is what this is, is that as you track the sun, the shadow of the sun, or no, the shadow of the feed should land on the boss. And uh, that's a good visual track that, uh, check that you're, you're, you're tracking the sun. And it needs to be able to do that throughout the day. Um, you can then use uh, a noise power meter to measure the sun noise. <laughs> and um, it comes as no surprise to us that Portsdown has now got a noise power meter in there. So you can take your Portsdown receiver, connect up your, your standard mini tuner TV card and use it to measure the sun noise as your dish tracks across the sky. Um, Mini Tuner, the, the the PC software, did used to do that um, as well, which is where we got the idea from. And uh, I just mentioned it to Dave, and you know, two days later he'd done it as as he does. So um, yeah, so you you can track, you can test most of your system. You can check your antennas. You can check that you're tracking the sun. And then the only thing finally left to do really is ideally you need to generate a, a local signal, which of course Portsdown will do, on 2395 and check that you decode it correctly. And in theory, in theory, if you've done that, you should, you should be able to receive it. So um, when will Ham TV be on? Well, it was... It was a bit variable when, during 2016, it certainly used to get, um, if I remember rightly, it used to share a power supply on the ISS, didn't it? And if they were running other experiments, ham TV would then be turned off so they could use the power supply for those other experiments. Um, it's also, it was also turned off 
for EVAs and when other spacecraft were docking. So it is a little bit variable. Even when it get, gets back up there, it will be variable. And what it will transmit once it's there, we're not quite sure. But it, 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 certainly the transmitter will be on at times. And um, it, certainly it was last time it was added to the AMSAT status page. And that, that gave a, a pretty good indication of when it, was, when it was potentially going to be on. Um, so, uh, and of course, I'll just go back here. Um, the other thing, it was used primarily for schools' contacts. It wasn't. It didn't tend to be used for occasional contacts. It was primarily used for the schools' contacts, and they are quite well publicised. So you would be able to know when a schools' contact in Europe was coming up, and uh, it would be on. So one of the one of the problems we found with it, with trying to use it for the schools' contacts, of course, is you've got about eleven minutes at absolute best from any one ground station and so Phil and a couple of other guys came up with the idea it would be great if we could merge the transport streams coming from a number of ground stations and then produce an output which was the summation of those ground stations and so once ham tv is back up and active we will be or phil will be implementing the ts merger system again and what that gives is uh, a continuous video stream from the iss so i think on, on a couple of the contacts we managed 25 minutes continuous video over europe and it, it streams on a on a channel and um, what you get is the actual video and audio um, and it gives a report of which ham tv stations or ground stations are actually receiving it so at this particular point goon hilly was there of course um, actually phil was there uh, f6 dzp wasn't getting it at that point in time uh, actually wooter pa3 weg was getting it but uh, somebody in Germany wasn't and so from those three receivers that were getting it uh, they, uh, the, uh, the, com the merger would merge the transport stream from the three to produce longer than uh, video longer than any one of the systems could possibly receive it so that that will be going back up again and that will be available and one, once it's up and running, you know, we'd encourage anybody who does receive Ham TV to contact us so we can put them onto the system to increase the coverage across Europe and 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 the rest of the world. So um, we talked about it. I thought it would be appropriate to uh, remind us just exactly what it did and the impact of it. And uh, in in the case of Aris, it was it was just awesome to go to the schools, and as well as having the audio contact, Kieran very soon found out that if he said on on the VHF uplink, "Give us a wave, Tim." <laughs> Guess what? Two seconds later, Tim did wave, and so you know we, we, the impact was was just tremendous. Um, I I remember the first time we ever got it, which was Rickmansworth. And, uh, you know, it, we, we put it up on the projector screen behind and we were all, will this work, will this work? And the VHF contact started and all of a sudden he appeared on the back screen and it sort of made the hairs on the back of your head, sta uh, back of your neck stand up. It really was uh, quite something. So anyway, here's a, here's a, a 10 minute video from um, one of the contacts we did in Norwich, school in Norwich. And... Uh, what we've done is this video has been put together showing the ham TV received by a couple of other stations as well so it gives an idea of how ham TV could be used to enhance a, a typical Aris voice contact GB1 SS the Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra this is GB2 CNS Golf Bravo 2 Charlie November Sierra, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Hello, Golf Bravo 2, Charlie November Sierra. This is Golf Bravo 1, Sierra Sierra. I reach you 555, I'll be over. 
Hi Tim, this is Tim, M6 HDJ. I, are you ready for your first question? Over. It's great to be talking to you, Doris, and yes, I'm ready for my first question. Over. Hi, this is Maddie. What do you do if you cut yourself really badly in space? Over. GB1SS, the Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra. This is GB2CNS, Golf Bravo 2 Charlie November Sierra. Listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Hello, Golf Bravo 2 Charlie November Sierra. This is Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra. I reach you 555. I'll be over. Hi, Tim. This is Tim, M6HDJ. I, are you ready for your first question? Over. It's great to be talking to you in Norwich, and yes, I'm ready for my first question. Over. Hi, this is Maddie. What do you do if you cut yourself really badly in space? Over. then we could actually give ourselves some local anaesthetic and stitch it up uh, with the help of some doctors back in uh, ground control if we need to. Over. Hi, this is Austin. Are there any protocols or guidance in place if George Clooney comes knocking on the front door as he did in the film Gravity? Over. Hi, Austin. Well, as far as I'm aware, we're the only six human beings in space up here, so if anybody comes knocking on our hatch, I'm not opening it. Over. Tim, it's Kieran M0XTD. We have you on Ham TV. Give us a wave. Here's your next question. Hi, this is Sophie. What experiment would you like to add to your mission based on the experiences you have had? Over. Hi Sophie, um, I would like to see us doing more of the medical research, um, you know, investigating some more vaccines and looking into uh, new drug methods as well. I think that's some of the most exciting research we're doing up here. Over. Hi, this is Max. In what ways does the lack of natural sunlight and fresh air affect you on the ISS? Over. Hi Max, I love opening the windows in the cupola when I'm in uh, Node 3 or in the uh, Japanese module. I love the sunshine coming through the windows and it does make a difference. It does kind of brighten up your day and make you feel better. And you just get used to the fact that we see so many day and night cycles. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte. How do you get changed in space when your clothes go everywhere? Over. Hi Charlotte, they do go everywhere. We have to use bungees. Uh, or we bungee our clothes down so they don't float off and you don't lose them. Over. Hi, this is Eden. One of the experiments you are conducting in space is to measure fluid shifts in the body. In what way does this help us back on Earth? Over. Hi Eden, that's a great question. Fluid shift really kicks off the whole process of the changes to our body. It's because of the fluid shift we get greater pressure in our head and we start to lose uh, bone density as well. So that triggers all the changes and it's by changing things in our body that we can learn about our body and we can investigate these things. Over. Hi, this is Thomas. With the basic design of the current spacecraft dating back decades, where do you think the next leap forward in spacecraft technology will occur? Over. Hi Thomas, yes, I mean we're playing with basic rules of physics and gravity here and laws of motion so um, I think that we're going to see big changes to our spacecraft in terms of our transit to Mars and transit to Moon um, but in terms of getting to low Earth orbit I don't think we're going to see many big changes that, that we have in current spacecraft design, over. Hi, this is Emily. How different was the, was the training compared to the experience of actually launching into space? Over. I believe the training was so good that it really prepared us for launching into space and there are very few differences between what we were training for on ground and how we live and work up here in space. Over. Hi, this is Millie. With improving technology on Earth, are there experiments that you are currently carrying out in space that could one day be repeated on Earth? Over. 
Yes, there are loads of uh, experiments up here that we're doing that could be repeated uh, on Earth. I think that it's going to be a long time before we um, manage to sort of counter gravity for a long period of time on Earth. So we use parabolic flights and drop towers. But the benefit of being up here in low Earth orbit is, of course, we have microgravity continuously. So we can do those experiments for a very long time. Uh, but we do repeat the experiments back on Earth, of course, to see the changes, to see what's difference between space and Earth. Over. Hi, this is Erin. Which materials being developed with the electromagnetic levitator will have the largest impact on the development of greener living? Over. Hi, Erin. Well, I think the metal alloys are the one area of research that are going to have the big impact on greener living uh, because that will affect how our engines are designed um, and uh, in particular our commercial aircraft turbine blades and turbine engines, for example, which will cut down fuel production and cut down fuel usage and uh, have a good impact in, in aviation. Over. Hi, this is Maddie asking Nolo's question. Since being in space, what has been your most amusing dream? Over. Hi, Maddie. Do you know, I, I haven't dreamt much up here in space. Uh, and when I do, I dream of Earth. I haven't yet dreamt of being in space. Um, and I think it's because we, we sleep quite heavily up here, actually. I, quite, I sleep quite well here in space. Over. Hi, this is Austin asking Libby's question. If everyone in Britain turned their lights on and off at the same time, would you hear it from space? Over. Hi, Austin. Yes, you definitely would see it. You know, we would see a, a small village if you turned your lights on and off. It's amazing that um, we, the lights really stand out very well from space. Um, and certainly a, a major city turning their lights on and off would stand out very clearly. Over. Hi, this is Sophie asking Ella's question. Which part of the Earth do you like orbiting over the most and why? Over. Hi Sophie, uh, I love orbiting over Africa, it just looks beautiful from space, it's like flying over a, a canvas of art um, and also North, northern Canada is beautiful, especially right now with all the ice and the, uh, even the sea is frozen up there, over. Hi, this is Max asking Amy's question, with sunrise and sunset occurring 16 times a day on board the ISS, does it have any noticeable effect on your body clock, over. Hi, Max, that's a great question. Yes, it does. You know, if, I, if I'm looking in the cupola late at night when it's bright sunshine, it does take me a while to get to sleep, uh, so I try not to do that. You have to kind of try and trick your body that it's night time when it's time to go to sleep. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte asking Mimi's question. How does being in space make you relate to your place in the universe? Over. Hi Charlotte, that's a great question. You know, I mean, being up in space gives a different perspective and it makes you realize how vast the solar system is, how vast the universe is. And also it makes you realize that our planet, uh, you know, it has no borders. It's got massive weather systems that uh, are affect all continents. And so it does give you that perspective of, of the planet as a whole, over. Hi, this is Eden asking Bruno's question. Is there a song or a piece of art that you think reproduces the feeling of being in zero gravity? If so, which one? Over. Hi, Eden. Well, I, as nothing particular comes to mind, but you know some of those pictures where things look uh, different upside down. For example, it might be a beautiful woman one way up and a, an old haggard woman what, the other way up. I think that's great because it, it makes you realize in space, of course, we have a different perspective depending on which way up we are. Over. GB2CNS returning. That was fantastic. Thank you. Everyone here would like to say a big thank you. This is GB to CNS handing back to handing back to GB1 SS for the final GB2 CNS off and clear. It's been wonderful talking to everybody in Norwich this afternoon. Have a great day and thank you for those brilliant questions. Uh, goodbye from the International Space Station. Out. Okay, well, I think you can uh, get a flavour there. Wrong way. GB. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, you can get a flavour of how that added to that contact uh, than just the standard voice contact. So uh, we're really... Um,
hoping that it will get back and uh, you know we can uh, we can start to do that sort of thing again so um, you know the, the question is what is beyond the ISS and Phil really is going to cover this um, after lunch but there is you know other things that we can be doing and one of the things we would really like to do is improve the video quality from the ISS but I think that's that there's all sorts of difficulties in doing that because that would need a complete new unit so it is a disappointment that we're putting back the current unit but you know we have got plans to to try and do other things in the future so you know hopefully um, I've inspired one or two of you to uh, start to think about it again and uh, you know any any uh, questions on uh, on that and as I say Phil will be continuing the story after lunch what's the method to um, switch transport streams uh, for the various receiving stations using MER or to uh, make a decision or uh, you're asking the wrong person <laughs> quick uh, well on what basis do you flip transport streams on the merge So the answer to the question was it switches, it, it's based on timestamps, so within the MPEG stream there are timestamps, so it looks at timestamps and selects the one that is not, not got errors in it, so uh, it merges based on timestamp segments. Any other questions? Again, has anybody utilised a satellite jack motor? Would that respond quick enough? to track it. I'm just thinking of surplus stuff that's available. Um, I'm looking around the room at the AMSA experts, but I suspect not. Nobody seems to be inspired by that. So, uh, no, I don't think it would give you the speed or the accuracy that you need. So, no. Any other questions? No. Okay. Okay.